Britain is an unequal place. Take London and Grimsby. Average wages in London was 60% higher. In 2019, around half of working age adults in London had a degree. In Grimsby, the share was less than a fifth. In his first speech as Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak listed his priorities. A stronger NHS, better schools, safer streets. And one aimed at reducing those geographical gaps. Leveling up. I'm Samaya Keynes, economics columnist at the Financial Times. And in this special episode of the IFS Zooms In, we'll discuss the economics of inequality between places. Why should we worry about it? And what could reduce it? This episode is based on some of the findings of the IFS Deaton Review of Inequalities, a multidisciplinary project exploring the causes and consequences of inequality in Britain, funded by the Nuffield Foundation. We'll hear from Professor James Banks, Senior Research Fellow at the IFS and member of the Deaton Review Panel, about how to think about geographic inequality as an economic problem. The same amount of talent isn't sort of flourishing, if you like, if it comes from a certain group. And it might be the case, you know, someone who's born in a particular region is just not being able to make their potential contribution to the economy. And we'll hear from Xiao Wei Zhu, a senior research economist at the IFS and author of the chapter Spatial Disparities Across Labour Markets. She'll talk about her work with Henry Ovman of the LSE, looking at the extent of Britain's problem. By and large, there's very little convergence and also the levels are high, right? So we saw this big increase in inequality after the 70s, the 80s, after the period of deindustrialization, and those gaps have basically stayed the same. Let's dive in. I started off by asking James Banks the question of why we should care. Why should we care about inequality between places? I think the first reason is just because people care. If you look at what are the most salient inequalities that the population sort of care about, inequalities between areas is often at the very top of that list. Going beyond that, you know, as an economist, we might think there could be what you might call an efficiency argument. There could be a misallocation of talent in the country if area differences or the difference between markets in different areas limit the degree to which people with skills can progress and sort of social mobility. Uh, and you know, even if there's not an efficiency argument, there might be an equity argument. We might care about inequalities. One of the themes of the Deaton Review is that inequalities are everywhere. There are many inequalities, but some are more concerning than others. If the inequalities between regions relate to sort of structural inequalities in the economy or relation inequalities between groups, then they may be cause for concern in their own right. And finally, a slightly different take on the question is why should we care now? You know, the sort of stagnation of productivity growth since the global financial crisis in 2008 has meant that in the past, you know, even the worst performing regions were growing a little bit. But now, as aggregate productivity growth has stagnated, the worst performing regions are really not getting any benefits at all over time. So economists should care about geographic inequality because people care, people hate it, but also because it could suggest that some people don't have the same opportunities as others. That means wasted potential. Now, you do sometimes hear the argument that inequality between places really isn't so much of an economic efficiency problem. It might not be holding back growth. It might just be the result of powerful forces that generate growth. There might be economic benefits from having certain kinds of people or certain kinds of companies all clustered together. Here's James to explain. Well, there are two sides to the story. I mean, the key issue to get into here is what economists call agglomeration externalities. And that's really the idea that two or more firms can somehow face lower costs if they're co-located next to each other in some way, geographically or, or other. So the, the, the classic argument in the literature when it was derived years ago was to do with labor search costs. So if you're a particular type of company that needs a sort of rather rare type of worker, then it's quite hard to find them in your vicinity. Uh, and if, you, if those companies are spread out all over the country, then each company is finding it quite hard to find those type of workers. But if they're all together, then you might actually generate a labor force locally, and suddenly the costs of search for employees and the cost of search for employers are reduced. So essentially, those co-located companies can together face lower costs than if they were spread out over the whole economy. And there would be equivalent externalities if you think about networking or technology. So we have a 
co-location of people producing high technology motor parts around the M4 corridor based around the Formula One industry. If you're the one guy who supplies spark plugs to Formula One cars, if, if all the other Formula One car makers are there, then all your clients are there, then it's much easier to sort of operate. So some places have been able to take advantage of these efficiencies associated with lots of people and businesses all being in the same place at the same time, complementing each other. And it could be that that's why they're richer than other places, which haven't gathered those people and businesses. It's a powerful theory, and no doubt, in some cases, it's very powerful in practice. Think of hubs like London's Financial Services Centre or Silicon Valley for tech. It's not necessarily a problem that people need to move for particular jobs if you care about growth. It could be super efficient to have these mega hubs that people move to. Embracing the forces of agglomeration and inequality between places could actually be good for growth. Now, think of economists like detectives, hunting for clues to show what exactly is driving the inequality between places. Is it the less worrying sort, reflecting the fact that there are these agglomeration benefits to rich people living near other rich people and that's part of what makes them rich? Or is it the more worrying sort, reflecting factors that are holding people back from reaching their potential? The hunt for clues always starts in the data, so let's hear from Xiao Xu, who has been on the case. I asked her how extreme Britain's spatial inequality is. It depends on how you're measuring inequality and what dimensions of inequality you're interested in. So there are huge differences in in productivity across places and also very large differences in wages. So, for example, in 2019, before the pandemic hit, the average wage in London was £21 an hour compared to just £13 an hour in places like Grimsby and Scarborough. So huge differences in wages. But then when you start looking at incomes, once you take taxes and benefits into account, then the differences are smaller. And then when you account for housing costs, which differ hugely across the country, those differences are smaller still. So it really does depend on what you're measuring. And what do we know about why Britain's spatial inequality is as high as it is? I think there's a simple statistical answer to that, and then there's a more complex, deeper answer. So the statistical answer is simply that it's down to skills. Um, High-skilled people are concentrated in certain places, and they earn more no matter where they lived, and that's what leads to differences in average wages across places. That's magnified by the fact that there are also differences in place effects. So some places would pay more for a given type of worker because they're more productive. And actually what you see is that people with high skills also tend to live in those high paying places. The place effects that magnify the individual differences in skills that you see. In the chapter, we do a simple statistical decomposition to look at what role skills versus place effects plays in explaining differences in average wages across the UK. And we find that, you know, roughly six to five percent of differences in average wages can be put down to differences in skills across places. Just 10 percent are accounted for by differences in place effects. And the remaining 25 percent is due to the fact that high earning people tend to live in high earning places. So you see that positive correlation. Okay, so it looks like there are these big differences across places because highly educated and high earning people are living near other highly educated and high earning people. What's the more complicated answer? So we know that there's huge educational differences across the UK. So only fewer than one in five kids who grow up in Grimsby will go on to get a degree. That compares to about one in three kids in London and, you know, nearly half of kids in places like Tunbridge Wells and High Wycombe. So you see these big differences in educational attainment across places. But then we also see differences in migration after people enter the labour markets, which then exacerbate those differences in skills. So people move to where there's demand for graduate jobs, and that tends to be in places that already produce large numbers of graduates to begin with. Yeah, I was really struck by some of the numbers in a study that you cited. I think it was around 60% of graduates from the poorest areas move away by the age of 27. And around a quarter of all graduates who move end up moving to London. So I guess I took away from that that there's this gravitational pull of these richer places for graduates, but that effect doesn't seem to be there for for non-graduates. And then when you have this dynamic, when you've got somewhere like Groomsby that 
isn't producing very many graduates. But then the few graduates that they are producing are leaving and going to places like London where graduates are already concentrated. Then that dynamic really reinforces this inequality between Grimsby and, and say, London. Exactly. So this dynamic is is very much self-reinforcing in that firms will, will locate where there's a skilled workforce, but skilled people will move to where there's good firms. And that really explains the sort of persistence of geographical inequalities across places. Once you start getting these agglomeration effects going, it's very difficult to create a counterweight. Now, one might take away from all that that the problem of regional inequality is one of skills. If most of the gap between rich and poor places is because people in richer places are more highly educated than those in poor places, then the problem might not be to do with particular places, but rather to do with people. Policymakers, perhaps, should improve the education of people. And if they focus too much on places, it's going to be a distraction. I put this to James. He thinks you have to dig deeper. You have to ask, why did those skills end up where they were. You know, why is it the case that skills differ across regions? And I think if you look deeper into this idea of what the places do, then you think about the way in which aspirations, expectations are created by your upbringing where you live. So in fact, those education differences in the population and those aspirations in, you know, what kind of jobs you want to search for are themselves probably a place effect. And at which point, then you start this idea that essentially the the sort of sorting in the economy is kind of holding back some of the potential productivity. So there might be frictions or there might be expectation differences in equilibrium, if you like. That means that we just get this misallocation of talent. So a particularly bright person, it's a little bit like the way they talk about in gender or ethnic minority differences in the labor market, you know the same amount of talent isn't sort of flourishing, if you like, if it comes from a certain group. And it might be the case, you know, someone who's born in a particular region is just not being able to make their potential contribution to the economy because of the way that the place has sort of deeply ingrained their educational choices, their aspirations, their job search. The fact that you have such big differences in educational attainment across places is a red flag. But let's return to something that Xiaowei just mentioned another clue. And that's the persistence of these geographic inequalities. I asked her to expand on that a bit. So inequalities in the UK are very persistent. So if you look at the last 20 years or so, if you just look at labour market inequalities across places, we do see a slight bit of convergence in wages and also employment rates across places. We see the poorest performing areas catching up a little bit. But by and large, there's there's very little convergence and also the levels are high, right? So we saw this big increase in inequality after the 70s, the 80s, after the period of deindustrialization, and those gaps have basically stayed the same. Even though there's been a slight bit of convergence over time, the relative positions of places in terms of their ranking has stayed essentially the same. So places that were performing poorly back in the late 90s or even the 80s are still those that are the ones perform poorly today. I asked James about this. Could it be that the persistence of these inequalities isn't necessarily anything to worry about? Couldn't it just be because the benefits of agglomeration are just very persistent over time? He wasn't convinced. Typically, we think areas that benefit from agglomeration effects still have to be rather large. We're not really talking about towns. Uh, And yet, when I'm talking about some of this evidence, you can even talk about blocks within towns. You know, there are cases where, you know, a particular steel factory was built and half of a town was downwind of it and the other half was upwind of it. And you can track that action of the building of the steel plant through to the education of people born from one side of the town to the other 100 years later. So the kind of area effects that are responding shocks can be very persistent that are at a geographical level that's well below agglomeration. Okay, so there is a weakness in this argument that all of the persistence that we see is just because of these sticky dynamics of agglomeration. Because some of the persistence in inequality is between areas that are too small for these agglomeration benefits to be very relevant. I think that takes you back towards what James was describing earlier as some of these more dangerous drivers of inequality. 
differences in expectations and aspirations that stick. Where does that leave us? It's not neat or tidy, but the reality is that the inequality that we see is probably a bit of the okay sort and a bit of the more worrying sort. I think it's too strong to say that you can explain 100% of what we see by appealing to agglomeration or these more dangerous factors. And of course, even if it were all based on agglomeration, we shouldn't forget that that first reason to care about inequality between places is that people really hate it. Let's move on now to talking about what policymakers should do. My first question here is, how big or small should policymakers be thinking? Should we be trying to reduce inequality between neighbourhoods or cities or regions? Here's James. Well, there are many different degrees of geographical granularity, and all of them could matter for different reasons. So if you're talking about agglomeration externalities, we typically think about rather large areas. Sometimes people talk about travel to work areas or commuter zones that are sort of multiple cities that could be commutable between. Potentially, even there's some evidence that agglomeration externalities need to be at an even bigger level of critical mass than that. So if that's the reason that you're interested in leveling up, then you need to be thinking at the big level. But you know, I think arguably a lot of the concern in the population and probably in policymakers as a result is about much more finer spatial inequalities that might be even an area within a town, a deprived area within a town, or certainly if you're thinking about where I'm from, for example, in Manchester, the, the issue of inequalities within Manchester uh, as Manchester grows, you know, this idea of how can Manchester get sort of sustainable, but also some degree of not inequality increasing growth. So there you're talking about areas within a city. But then, you know, it, politically speaking, you might be thinking much more about the north-south divide or the red wall, or you might be thinking about the coast. You know, all these are different political narratives. They're all sort of about spatial differences, but they're all different. They all point to different problems and they all need different solutions. This matters for thinking about infrastructure. What do you want to connect to what? Or it matters for when it comes to empowering local government, who you'd think would have a better idea of local needs than, say, civil servants in central London. What is the appropriate level of devolution? Too fragmented and you won't be able to get anything useful done. Too centralised and you're just back to what the UK already has, which is a very centralised system. The next question is, what to do about this. And building on the research of Xiaowei and Henry Ofman of the LSE, skills do seem really important. Between 64% and 90% of the difference in average wages across areas can be attributed to differences in the type of people who work in those different areas. So maybe you need something to encourage more skilled jobs in particular places, or just boosting skills in those places. You have to be careful though. Here's James. I mean, any economist will tell you that there's always a risk with any policy that it will just lead to sort of a reshuffling of activity or even a relabeling of activity that would otherwise have gone elsewhere. In this case, that would be like saying that policy is just not going to generate any agglomeration externalities. It's worth saying that if you care about spatial inequalities from an equity point of view, that might still be okay. So, you know, an activity that would have taken place in London and now going to take place in Grimsby might be all right for, for leveling up objectives. But one would still have to sort of work that through. But I think that really, if we're talking about things that don't work, I think we have to think about policies that address only one side of the demand and supply equation. Okay, so let me just go through this for a minute. So for leaving aside the problem of policy being effective, suppose the government's got a magic wand. This is what I do with my students quite a lot. Imagine a magic wand that you could wave. So you don't have to worry about will the policy work or not. Let's assume that policy will meet its objectives. Suppose your objective is to increase skilled jobs in an area. So you wave your wand, suddenly you can magically create a whole ton of skill, skilled jobs in an area. Is that going to help? No. Why? Because essentially a whole bunch of people from outside the area are going to move in. They'll take those skilled jobs. Prices will go up. Wages will go up. The area will gentrify. There'll be more within area inequality. And the original people in that area won't particularly benefit. Now, we've seen that with policies around the world. And arguably, you might say we're seeing a little bit in Manchester. On the other hand, suppose you wave the magic wand and say, OK, I need to worry about the supply of skills. So suddenly, I'm going to magically give everybody in this area a university degree. 
Is that going to work? No. Why? Because they're all going to come down to London to get the jobs that are in London. Okay, so it's quite clear that policies that address either the demand for skills or the supply of skills are going to have trouble. And really, you need to be addressing both sides of that coin simultaneously. And to make it harder, it's not even simultaneous because, of course, the supply of skills takes a while to generate. So you've got to have the jobs on stream when the skills have been accumulated in the area for the local people, if you like, to, to, to benefit. Those are the kind of things I think that's really difficult to argue that they work, is that things that are really just addressing demand or just supply, those are the kind of policies that are going to be undone by these sorting effects. And they're going to just really lead to this reshuffling. Nobody ever said this would be easy. Sorry. Now, tying together those two points that James just made, next I wanted to ask him about a recent initiative to help with levelling up. That's investment zones. Now, there have been various versions of this policy, but the latest involves tax breaks for businesses in particular locations, as well as funds for skills boot camps or infrastructure. Altogether, these investment zones are supposed to create hubs of economic activity and boost Britain's productivity, all while addressing geographic inequality. Policymakers here are assuming that the benefits of agglomeration exist, but they're saying that these benefits don't always occur naturally. It is possible for government intervention to bring them about. So, while America has Silicon Valley, The government is trying to create hubs for digital and tech firms, green industries, life sciences, advanced manufacturing and the creative industries. There's supposed to be collaboration with universities and lots of partnerships with businesses and local leadership and and so on and so forth. Now, if you think back to the research of Xiaowei and Henry Overman, they find that a big chunk of wage inequality between places is because people with high skills, high education are clustering together. And and you might think that they're clustering together because they're going to where the good jobs are. And there's a sort of virtuous cycle where companies go to where they can find lots of people with the skills that they want. Investment zones are supposed to try to kick off those virtuous cycles. I asked James what he thought of the policy. We come to the issue of granularity again. I mean, you know, if if these investment zones are small, then even within an investment zone, you might not have enough critical mass to generate the agglomeration externality that you need. And as they get bigger, these investment zones, you might worry about the within investment zone infrastructure being sufficient to generate the agglomeration externality. So this is what, you know, the northern cities are talking about. We really need, if we think of the northern cities as one agglomeration zone rather than seven cities, which I think is, you know, arguably might just be big enough to generate, then you need to worry much more about you know, transport, data, infrastructure and services within that zone to be able to allow all the enterprises within that zone to benefit from the agglomeration activity. It's not so much how that zone is connected to and from the other zones, it's even within itself. So I think those are the issues probably with the enterprise zones is like what level of granularity are they looking at? Is there enough on the within zone infrastructure? And then is there enough tie-in and restriction of these policies to make sure that the local residents are actually engaged and can benefit and are not just going to be displaced by high-skilled migrants into the area, whether these migrants are from the UK or elsewhere? We're economists here, and so, of course, we're going to think about the risks, the unintended consequences, or the ways that this policy might not work. And and so one way that these sorts of zones could fail to achieve what is intended is that they simply do not create big agglomeration benefits. Maybe the policies aren't big enough, or maybe they operate at the wrong level of geography. Or it could be that agglomeration effects just aren't as important in explaining differences between places as some people might think. The other risk is that the tax breaks and the funding could look like they're being super successful, but it could be a mirage. Now, what if you give an area all these benefits and then a bunch of well-off, highly educated people move in while the locals can't take advantage of these new opportunities? The place might look like it's getting richer, and, and sure it is, but the people who were there before might miss out. So essentially, you might just be shuffling the inequality around rather than really reducing it. If you look at examples of other place-based policies, specifically European regional development funds, there is some evidence that they work a bit better where there is already a highly skilled workforce. And that's a bit worrying 
because it suggests that you might need an area to be doing okay to begin with if you want the government intervention to to create a really high productivity cluster. It could be that there is a trade-off between your ability to, to get agglomeration effects, boost growth in particular areas, and your ability to lift up the very poorest places. Now, just because we don't want to end on that depressing note, my last question for James was, are these zones the best we can do? What else should we be considering? Well, I think you could get a little bit from the enterprise zones and the kind of things that come from the centre that are addressing agglomeration externalities. But realistically speaking, I think you would get much more if you focused on more decentralised policies that were arising from sort of some kind of local autonomy, local engagement. And as long as they were backed with essentially the the finance to, to allow them to enact. So, you know, at the very least at the city level, because, you know, so the idea essentially that local policymakers can design and implement the kind of broader policies that will have the sort of broader social health crime or whatever outcomes. The idea that I think these can be leveled up from the center, I think, is really difficult. And one has to sort of really think about a much broader level of community engagement. Now, what the right geographical granularity of that community engagement is to be is a difficult question, but at least should be thought about. And it seems to be that the center isn't the right answer. Thanks, James. And I think it is worth mentioning that the government does seem to be trying to think about all of this. It does have devolution deals with various local authorities, Although I suppose whether that's at the right level is probably the topic of another podcast. But to wrap up this episode, a lot of the debate out there is about whether the problem with poorer places is that they lack skills or if it's because they lack infrastructure. And if you do a statistical decomposition, like Xiaowei mentioned earlier, you can make the case that a lot of the differences between places are simply because there is a big gap in the skills of their populations. But... As I think both Xiaowei and James would agree, you need to go deeper if you want to understand why some places are poor and others are rich. Factors like infrastructure, effectiveness of local governance, aspirations could all be relevant here. And certainly, at least stated policy seems to be moving in the direction of trying to exploit agglomeration effects and and recognizing that you need lots of things to work together for a particular place to be a growth success. That's it for this episode. If you're interested in the evidence gathered as part of the IFS Deaton Review, you can find it at ifs.org.uk forward slash inequality. Huge thanks to James Banks and Xiaowei Zhu of the IFS. I'm Samaya Keynes, economics columnist at the Financial Times. Alex Catling was our audio producer. And thank you for listening.